this is going to be in the next 20, 30, 40 years, a district that has very thick transit. But as you say, we also need, we need those first mile, last mile solutions for connection to transit. And we need that bikeability and walkability for everyday life as well. And you know, LA has like the best weather in the, in, in the country <laughs> and a very flat topography. And so it's a perfect biking and walking city if we just uh, have the political will to redesign our streets to make it safe. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John and that was Scott Epstein, an urbanist and active mobility advocate who happens to be running for city council in Los Angeles. And so this is a very special episode because I've never actually interviewed a potential politician while they're running for office. Scott and I talk a lot about land use planning, creating more housing near meaningful destinations, and accelerating the investment in active mobility infrastructure. I hope you enjoy this episode. Scott Epstein, it's absolute pleasure to have you on the Active Towns podcast. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me, John. Really, really excited to be here. Well, hey, uh, you were introduced to me by uh, by Josh Paget. Um, yeah. You know, with uh, you know, formerly it was the New Urbanism Film Festival, and I yes. know that they've kind of changed the name. I think it's Better Cities and and yeah. something uh, along those lines now. Um, and so and 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 Josh, of course, is in the Los Angeles area once again. So he and his his uh, his wife just moved back to the area. I think they're in the Hermosa Beach area, which is where I learned how to surf. Uh, oh, nice. And uh, and 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 I know he's he's a pastor uh, minister at, at a local church there. How do you know Josh? Yeah, so this is actually kind of a fun story. So. Um, I, uh, my entryway into community work was through uh, the neighborhood council system. So Los Angeles has a system, a sort of grassroots democracy system uh, of 99 neighborhood councils uh, across the city. Uh, and when I moved here, I got excited about the moment that LA was having of sort of becoming a world city around issues of transportation, housing. Um, the, the increase in civic discourse around those issues was exciting to me. I wanted to get involved. Um, and so I ran for the neighborhood council and everything kind of snowballed for me from there. A couple of years in, I was realizing that, um, I needed to kind of build a base, uh, on our mid, on, on the board of the neighborhood council for the ideas that we're going to be talking about today. You know, how do we. Uh, build a multimodal transportation system for Los Angeles? How do we make sure that we build livable neighborhoods? Um, and I needed more sort of comrades. Uh, and I started to talk to people and reach out to people in my community to recruit them to run for the neighborhood council. One of the people that I became, uh, that I that I learned of was Josh Paget. So um, uh, his uh, his film festival uh, was happening right in Mid-City West, where I was a neighborhood council board member. I attended it, um, went to one of the screenings. Josh introduced the films and talked about his love of new urbanism. And I was really intrigued by him. And then I, uh, uh, our, our council under my leadership had voted to support a bike lane in Beverly Hills, which uh, was implemented uh, many years later. Um, and so I went to Beverly Hills City Hall, we're just east of Beverly Hills, my neighborhood, um, to advocate for this bike lane that my neighborhood council had voted to support. Um, and I actually ran into Josh Paget in the bathroom. He didn't know who I was. <laughs> and I said, you're Josh Paget, right? How would you like to get involved in our community? Would you want to um, uh, run for our neighborhood council? And he uh, took up that call to action. He was elected that year and the yet rest is history. We're very close friends now and have done a lot. We've recruited each other for our efforts. So I recruited him to be a part of the neighborhood council. He was a very important board member for a number of years. He recruited me uh, to be a board member of uh, the New Urbanism Film Festival. And I helped with community engagement and getting speakers for, for, for that event. Uh, and we've been uh, 
working together since and now happily he's back in the LA region. Yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. And and I I, I also uh you know know Josh uh, through New Urbanism, the New Urbanism uh, movement, the the film festival. Um I submitted a few uh, a film a few years ago and actually won the, the the award for the top architecture film uh, that particular year, so it's all good stuff. And and I know that neighborhood, uh, you know, that area of LA quite well. Uh, so I'm a fourth generation Los Angelino. Um, so my family was really in the downtown area um, at the turn of the century, and then quickly moved um, up to the Highland Park area. And then uh, later, decades later, like in the 1950s, uh, they were out uh, in the uh, Glendora area. So out in, in the, you know, one of the, along the 210 corridor and all that. Mm-hmm. And I did go back to school. Uh, I, I moved away. My family moved away in the 1970s to Northern California. But uh, when it came to, to, to go to school, I, I, I decided that... Uh, I had a dream of going to USC, and so I, I even though I grew up on a, a small ranch in Northern California, this little farm boy from, you know, a town of four thousand people, I, I was like, okay, I'm gonna go to USC, and so sure enough, I was back in LA, and um, I actually lived in a house um, right in the district, just bordering where you're at. I think I was in yeah. um, very, very close to Western Avenue, um, part of uh, Koreatown, um, mm-hmm. and. Uh, uh, lived, you know, in a old Victorian home, and it was hilarious too. During the every little earthquake, you know, the the whole house would shake and creak, <laughs> and you'd hear the noise, the the nails just straining, and all that. So it's good stuff. So I know that your area, you know, quite well in in that yeah. district. And I think what would be really fun for us to do to to give some context to, uh, you know, the work that you were doing, and uh, and also pay tribute to, to Josh a little bit more here is to play your video that you submitted yeah. to the film festival. How does that sound? Absolutely. So, so this video was actually uh, directed by my wife, Elizabeth okay. Yarwood. Uh, and it's about this neighborhood Greenway project that I conceived uh, and is getting implemented now. Fantastic. And it's not very long. So, you know, I, I would propose that we'll just, we'll hit play and watch it. But if, if uh, it, at any point in time you want us to hit pause uh, because we'll have sound as well. Just just let me know, and we'll we'll hit sound, and then we can you know you can make some reflections on it, and we can, can continue. Sounds great. All right, fantastic. Let's hit play. Well, in a lot of ways, we could be a wonderful biking neighborhood. We have a lot of destinations within close distance, and a lot of people. My name is Scott Epstein and I'm the chair of the Mid-City West Community Council. A bicycle friendly street is a low volume street, a side street, where we use traffic calming to create a shared space for cyclists, pedestrians, and motorists. Our plan includes two bicycle friendly streets, one east-west from La Brea on the east to La Cienega on the west, and one north-south route along Formosa and Cochran Avenues from Romaine on the north to San Vicente on the south. And first we needed to get the buy-in of the people on the neighborhood council to support the plan. So we help people understand that this was going to be something that was going to be good for everybody. Everything is fairly close within this neighborhood. Um, you know, I believe in that, in that two-mile radius, that, that Aaronsville around your house where you can you know, get to Trader Joe's faster, get to the Grove faster, get to school faster than you can in a car. So really the only uh, Im- impediment is, is traffic and distracted drivers. So uh, uh, we're on Rosewood here now, which we're trying to make into a, a bicycle friendly street, a green street. And that's it's the kind of street where you uh, uh, guide cars off of it and guide bikes to it. It's still open to traffic, still open to parking, but it's a much more comfortable environment to ride. Um, I feel like I'm a confident rider and I can ride on most any street, but my wife, less so. My kids, uh, they might be more confident, but I'm not sure I want them riding on the, you know, the more major streets in our neighborhood, Beverly, Melrose, Fairfax. Uh, so it's traffic is the problem. And if, and, I, uh, and if we can figure out a way that bikes and cars can coexist, then we have a winning, winning situation. 
Traffic diverter is a treatment generally at an intersection where we would use a curb in the street to require that a motorist usually turn right off of the street but allow for some space for cyclists and pedestrians to continue on the bikeway. Well, a roundabout is a way of allowing cyclists to keep their speed up to some extent at an intersection without coming to a full stop, but it requires that motorists kind of look around them, yield and take the intersection slowly. A bike box is an advanced waiting area for a cyclist at an intersection. And so if you have a crosswalk and a bike box, you're sort of giving the different types of users of the street different levels of priority. That way everybody can be seen. And it's really important for safety that motorists can see pedestrians and see cyclists. So a bike box allows a cyclist to be in front of the motorist waiting at the intersection. And we started advocating for the plan with our city agencies and council district offices. When an opportunity for funding came along, which was Metro's 2015 call for projects, we worked collaboratively to create an application to Metro to fund the project, which ended up being successful. We're excited about implementing these bicycle-friendly streets because they work for everybody. Everybody deserves to be safe. I love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and I can see on your your face too that it, there's a great deal of joy to to yeah know, press play on. So what year was that? Was that around 2014 or? Uh, so the film was directed. Yeah, maybe 2014, 2015. The the, the I, I conceived the project in um in like. 2013, we got neighborhood council support for it. That year, I got it through the committee, through general board. Then we started advocating um, with the city agencies and elected officials. Um, and the, uh, in 2014, we did um, we did that community engagement event. I think that was the friendly ride that you see a still from, mm -hmm. um, where we went to six different. Uh, we, we went across the route to six different intersections. Talked about what they look like now, what they would look like uh, under the plan. And then 2015 was the call for projects that got um, officially funded like in September 2015. Um, and then since then, we've been working to slowly implement it. Okay. How far along are you with uh, some of the projects that were outlined? Well, so not as not as far along as, along as I would like. Right. Um, uh, because... You know, LADOT has kind of kept on kind of elongating the timeline for the project. Okay. Um, first, they have to wait for money to come in, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Um, the, the progress that has been made um, has been mostly um, us advocating for smaller changes along the way. Okay. So I was able to get five four-way stop signs through and then... Uh, we retooled an existing diverter to make it safe for um, for people on bikes because mm -hmm. you actually couldn't go through the intersection there on 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 bikes. It was a uh, a diverter designed for car traffic to so that people wouldn't use uh, uh, side streets to get to a, a big shopping center. So we were able to uh, sort of make a tactical change there right, through right. advocacy and 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 uh, communication with our local um traffic bureau uh, transportation bureau um and then the biggest change so far has been this um bicycle what what the city is calling bicycle friendly traffic signal um okay. at rosewood and la brea so um you gotta keep on yeah. these elected officials and engineers because if you don't they'll they'll do it wrong so the 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 council member had actually promised to create a traffic signal um at that location to some other stakeholders 
um, particularly the Orthodox community, which very rightly uh, was concerned about this was like the only unsignalized intersection uh, practically on all of La Brea right. in our area. Um, and so when I got wind of it, I, I realized, oh, they're going to mess it up <laughs> unless I tell them how to do it because it was part of our plan. So we were able to get um, them to implement it the correct way. So uh, uh, vehicle traffic has to turn right onto La Brea. Okay. And uh, bicycle and bicycle traffic can um, can continue through the intersection. So it's the city's first bicycle friendly traffic signal. There's there's the traffic signal with the the bicycle stencil on it. Um, there's a leading pedestrian inter interval for for um, the crosswalk, um, and uh, it's pretty exciting. People people right. like it a lot. It's the it's the first of its kind in Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah. And I, if memory serves, because when I when I was there at the film festival in 2017, it seemed to me like there was a few streets that uh, probably a little east of you that had been, um, you know, prioritized as as bicycle routes that were you know sort of traffic calmed and had some other traffic calming elements, uh, you know, to yeah. them. And one of the things that I I don't think most people really realize is just how rich. Um, and beautiful some of these residential side yeah. streets are uh, in the Los Angeles area. I mean, just, you know, uh, yeah. again, with the deep history of, of my family being there, you know, since the 1800s, it, uh, the, you know, there, there's beautiful old homes there. It's pretty much, especially in old Los Angeles, it's all a grid <laughs> for the mm -hmm. most part mm -hmm. until you start mm -hmm. getting into, into, you know, some of the topography that, you know, creates challenges. Um, yeah. but yeah, there, there was some, there was a couple of East West routes that I was able to just jump on my bike, uh, from mm -hmm. where the film festival was and ride all the way downtown. Yeah. Yeah. You probably were on fourth street maybe. Yeah. It was fourth street. Is, yeah. 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 Which, uh, needs some improvements, but has actually yeah. been on yes. the bike plan since the 1970s. Yeah. And you're, and you're right. Of course, that some of these neighborhoods are gorgeous with uh, single family homes, but also, beautiful uh, missing middle housing built in the 20s through the 40s, bungalow courts, fourplexes, duplexes, courtyard, apartment buildings. And one of the things that excited me about this, in addition to sort of the bike mobility element was, you know, we have a parks equity issue in Los Angeles. A lot of folks don't have um, access to green space. And, you know, it's this sort of opens open streets up to be linear parks in a, in a way. And so that was really exciting to me to kind of make that public space even more public in a way. Yeah. Yeah. You, uh, you threw out a bunch of really cool stuff there that I want to follow up on. And uh, one of them is the fact that um, this past week I re-released uh, the film that actually won the architecture award at the new urbanism film festival, which was pocket neighborhoods uh, with, mm. uh, with architect Ross Chapin. And of course, mm. Los Angeles and the Pasadena area is sort of the origins of the, the whole cottage court and the bungalow yeah. thing. And, uh, and I, I see that there's a, a photo that uh, y'all sent my way and I'm like, Oh, cool. Cause this, this, is exactly what you're talking about when you talk about yep. the the you know the creative opportunities of that missing middle type of housing. Talk a little bit about more about that and the opportunities that exist in the Los Angeles area in your district to you know yeah. go back to the future here. <laughs> yeah, it's an issue that I'm really passionate about and I've been talking a lot about in in my campaign. In fact, we do this series of urban hikes uh, in each neighborhood. We've done. Uh, six of them so far our seventh one is is coming up this sunday where we talk about public policy issues on the ground and let people feel and see and touch them and this is one of the the issues that we've been talking a lot about which is we need to figure out how to build gentle density or missing middle housing again so this is really the housing that built los angeles in the 1920s through 40s um and continues to provide really dignified beautiful living for folks i live in a uh, run, uh, front rear duplex. Um, I am not able to afford a single family home. I don't see that happening soon in very expensive Los Angeles, but I've been very lucky in the past year to be able to move to this location and actually have a lot of the amenities that single family um, uh, homeowners enjoy. Like I have 
really nice out your out, outdoor space now. Never had that in Los Angeles before. And so, and these are just treasured building types by uh, Angelinos. You, you try to tear down a bungalow court in Los Angeles um, and people get very upset. <laughs> and rightly um, so. I mean, gosh, and rightly look so at it. Because they're, they're gorgeous and they, they help build community. You know, that open space is a real community builder as well. They obviously front beautifully to the sidewalk. So they encourage um, walking and, and, and biking. Um, but we can't build it anymore. Yeah. It's functionally illegal, uh, primarily due to um, parking uh, requirements, but also zoning and other regulations as well. Um, and so, and I think that, you know, obviously these styles are very nice. I mean, the Spanish Revival, this one is sort of a, I think like a Chateau-esque Normandy style revival. And they're lovely, but that's not the only thing that people are responding to. They're responding to the human scale, um, to the sense of community. And I think it would be possible to do that in a contemporary style that people would really enjoy for renting or ownership as well. So, um, and I think, so I think a lot, a lot of people understand this um, and um, are excited about the idea of, of expanding um, the options for folks. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and it's, again, it's, a, you mentioned it earlier, it's, it's gentle density. So it's that opportunity yeah. to create more housing, uh, near meaningful yeah. destinations. And then when yeah. you're able to work on, uh, improving and enhancing the safe and inviting aspect of, um, active mobility options of being able to walk and bike, you know, suddenly you're freeing people up, you know, from you're, you're adding more housing, you're adding more people to an area and, uh, you know, closer to those meaningful destinations and, and the ability to to get there. So it, it's all part of it's all interconnected and all part of the solution. Absolutely. I, I, I mean, I see land use and transportation as just two sides of the same coin, you know, yeah. public realm, private realm. We have to be thinking about these things in concert. Um, and as you say, like these buildings are scaled to appropriately to the neighborhoods. And so they're more politically palatable to folks. I mean, mo most of the uh, multifamily housing in, in Los Angeles is one to two story. That's what people are used to. Turns out you can get pretty dense living in one to two story housing. Um, and, and it's also the most naturally affordable building type. They're pretty cheap to construct because you don't have to use, you know, a lot of steel or other expensive materials. So I think it's uh, we need to bring the solution back to Los Angeles. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And and uh, I'm just going to kind of scan a few of these housing types in, in the neighborhood. And so these are part of uh, these are snapshots from some of your urban walks and urban yeah. hikes. Uh, tell us a little bit about that as I kind of scan through here. Yeah, so um, we, we've we been doing them since August. So Los Angeles uh, has very large city council districts. We only have 15 council districts in the whole city of 4 million-ish folks. Wait a minute, um, wait a minute, wait a minute. What was that again? Yeah, so so the, the number of constituents in yeah. each council district is about 270,000 people. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing, right? Basically so there's all the size of, of a pretty good sized city. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and they have and the council members have a lot of control over what happens in, in their districts. Yeah. Um, and so um, one of the things that we thought would would bring our campaign closer to, to the community was to do these urban hikes that get to all of the different areas and and um, and and allow folks to engage with our campaign at the local level. And, and what's really been exciting is we talk about public policy issues uh, in the process. So for example, in Pico Robertson, we visited um, the oil drill operation that is directly adjacent to Pico Boulevard and residences. There was actually just an, an, an oil spill at that um, drilling operation just a couple of weeks ago. And so we we're able to talk about, you know, 
the Wild West culture that Los Angeles has tolerated when it comes to the oil industry, how we can change that, how we can bring more accountability um, and fossil fuel extraction in our city. Uh, we've talked about transit, active transportation, first mile, last mile solutions, missing middle housing, transit oriented development. Um, we talked about the, the history of, of uh, racial covenants and exclusionary zoning, um, tactical urbanism, um, you know, so just a slate of different issues. And then we often get guest speakers um, to uh, talk about the community projects that they've been involved in or, or, or share their policy expertise. And it's been a really enriching experience for, for me um, and for the attendees. Yeah. So I, I just scanned a couple of, uh, of, of through a, a couple photos there that were more um, transportation and transit oriented there. Yeah. So I, I want to pause on this one because of a couple of reasons. One, it, it shows that this is some lighter, quicker, cheaper um, yeah. attempts to try to uh, create some traffic calming um, aspects of what's the story behind this particular image? Yeah. So this is um, South Robertson. Um, so this is actually uh, a Great Streets project. So um, the mayor's office it was one of the first um, projects that they start that Garcetti started when he came into office um, was this Great Streets project um, uh, to uh, and the idea is to create a more of a sense of place in key commercial um, corridors of, of importance to communities. Um, and it established uh, partnerships between local community organizations in the city to make um, improvements. So here you're seeing um, uh, the, some of the tactical urbanism improvements that have been made in, in um, the South Robertson Great Street. They include these um, uh, tactical uh, curb extensions, a bus waiting area, and they've I mean, they, they've started to do more permanent uh, improvements as well. Um, so they have a, a, a concrete curb extension now. And they did it first with, I believe, with bollards and paints, and now they're starting to get to that second stage. Um, so this was the the very end of our Pico Robertson urban hike, and we kind of talked about tactical urbanism. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, this is uh, the type of tactical urbanism that uh, is city sponsored in the sense that it's uh, lighter, quicker, cheaper, putting some materials out there to demonstrate, uh, you know, really what could be uh, permanent infrastructure in, in the future. And of course, this is a transit uh, loading area. And, uh, and again, just really reimagining what, um, you know, the street space can be. And yeah. it's interesting. I love this this you know series of photos of the streetscape because you can kind of see that a lot of the buildings are oriented you know right to the curb um, in that area and 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 the need for for quality pedestrian space and um, you know having that opportunity to try to you know slow the traffic down a little bit uh, yeah. because part of it is that a lot of the old you know, urbanism is pretty good in Los Angeles. It yeah. just needs some fine tuning. It just needs, you know, some really some TLC to, to yeah. bring it along um, to, to make it truly, truly extraordinary. Yeah. And so you can actually in this stay on that photo because you can see actually this is the more temporary material version mm -hmm. that they built. So you can actually see where the curb was extended here. Um, right. That line um, uh, that that line down the sidewalk was where it used to be. Right. And it's exactly. amazing just that's those, you know, five feet, how how big of a difference it makes. There's a, a gallery and a restaurant right there. Right. Um, and all of a sudden there's a real public space that you would want to be in um, uh, at that location. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. So you've been campaigning uh, for a while. W when is the election, actually? The election is June 7th. That's the oh. primary. Okay, the primary is June seventh, and um, I, I don't I don't follow politics in, in Los Angeles at all anymore. Um, <laughs> but I but I'm you know astounded by how huge these council districts are. Uh, yeah. Give give a little bit of the lay of the land. So there there's there's how how many districts again? 
There are 15 council districts. Okay, 15 council districts. Yeah. And um, what's the population, um, you know, of of the actual city city council, you know, the, the actual Los Angeles city? Because when people say Los Angeles, they're, it's really not yeah. just Los Angeles city. I mean, it's like an entire region. So each district is about 260 to 270,000 constituents. Hmm. Uh, the whole city is like a little less than 4 million. Okay. Um, the county is 10 million. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And what's really, really interesting is LA city proper for the most part, you know, and again, especially like within your district is extraordinarily, um, dense in, in mm-hmm. the sense that it, it's, it's not mm-hmm. like what some people might imagine if they yeah. think of um, suburban sprawl and very, very yeah. low densities. Uh, yeah. You know, old Los Angeles has, you know, pretty decent density to it, which is one yeah. of the reasons why that transit can work there and, mm-hmm. and for the large part is starting to work much better with the, you know, with really some amazing investments that have been happening and many more investments that need to happen. But more importantly, to I think what you've been talking about a lot about is if you really want transit to be truly successful, you have to be able to walk and bike to be able to meet, you know, you, you have to be able to, to deal with those last mile, first and last mile deal you know, aspects of it. Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, so CD five is, um, you know, pretty much all that old Los Angeles that you were talking about, you know, it was all developed in the, you know, mostly CD five was developed in like the twenties through forties. Um, and so there's a very good grid. Um, uh, and basically all of the building blocks for, uh, traditional urban design kind of lifestyle. Um, and, and we also have the, uh, the most ambitious, um, expansion of transit in the country. Uh, so in, in CD five, uh, we are currently building the, the subway, um, the West side extension of the subway, uh, which will, uh, go past Westwood. Um, we are envisioning a heavy rail corridor through the Sepulveda Pass that would connect the valley through to the west side. Um, we're uh, envisioning an extension of the Crenshaw Line north through the Fairfax District. And so, you know, this is going to be in the next 20, 30, 40 years, a district that has very thick transit. But as you say, we also need, we need those first mile, last mile solutions. Um, for connection to transit, and we need that bikeability and walkability for everyday life as well. Um, so, um, and you know, LA has like the best weather in the in in the country, <laughs> and a very flat topography, and so it's a perfect biking and walking city if we just uh, have the political will to redesign our streets to make it safe. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, the other aspect of of you know having the great weather that that Los Angeles has is you know that opportunity to to you know better reimagine you know public space yeah. and um, there because when you it, it especially with those images you kind of get a sense that yeah there's there's a lot of opportunity to to use space better and there's a lot of abandoned space and so mm-hmm. I, I see that you know some of the the things that you've been you know active in are are you know again going back to some of the uh, tactical urbanism isn't it? <laughs> tactical urbanism types of things. Easier for me to say, uh, you know. But you know, engaging people and and talking a little bit about how we can reimagine uh, this space. You know, taking space that you know maybe was parking, maybe was something else, and, and creating some you know public space. Talk a little bit about some of these initiatives. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, this is you know, something I've been working on for a long time. So, um, actually, actually going back to Josh Paget, um, it was one of his key contributions to the neighborhood council is he said, we should do this thing called parking day. Um, and we ended up doing it for many years in a row. Um, it started with one parking spot, uh, a year or two later, it was 
a whole festival with four parking spots uh, around uh, the neighborhood. Uh, a year after that, we actually create a tactical urbanism plaza uh, to test out a concept for um, a plaza adjacent to Melrose Avenue, um, which we almost got done, but was uh, killed because of uh, opposition in the neighborhood from a, a few loud voices and our, our current council member listening to them. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think the streets are one of our greatest opportunities, not just um, to redesign for mobility, but for play, for gathering, for community building. The images that you see on the screen right now, um, this was one of the most fun things that we did um, in our urban hike series. It was our, our most recent urban hike in my neighborhood, in Greater Carthay, um, uh, in December. And we actually created a little, as one stop of our hike, as the midpoint, the rest stop, we created a little tactical urbanism plaza. And it was one of the most exciting things that we've done on our urban hikes because um, that space came to life for an hour. I mean, it was just proof of concept, um, not just for the attendees who were having a ball, you know, eating their snacks and chatting with each other in a beautiful neighborhood. But also, by the way, folks that were just strolling, walking their dogs, walking with their kids. I had some folks that heard about it that came just for that, that didn't come to the whole hike. And it was just just like such a thrill to see people in space enjoying themselves, building community. Um, there's so little of that um, in Los Angeles, and there's so much opportunity. Um, so that was a lot of fun. It's something that, that I'm... I really hope to do on the city council. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, I think we have a, 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 a Twitter uh, video. Let's, let's give a try. It. And... Oh yeah. So uh, Scott, why don't you, speaking of that, that idea of public space and everything, why, uh, we'll press play on this, but why don't you set this up real quick? Yeah. Yeah. This is one of my favorite videos that we've taken. So this was on our Pico Robertson urban hike. Um, so we're, we're in an area of Pico Robertson where there's a lot of civic institutions, a beautiful park, some, some different religious, um, um, buildings, uh, an ashram, a, a church, um, fire, there's a fire station, there's a library, and there's just very little to connect it. And also this excess, excess space, um, that, um, is underutilized and also creates some safety hazards. And so here I am talking about how we could reimagine that space. All right, let's press play. Institutions exist here, and there's very little to kind of tie that fabric together to kind of give you a sense of place. And so I want to just I want you to just imagine how we could how we could change that. For example, what is going on here? <laughs> events to spill out from these institutions with shade trees that you could stand under instead of being in this crazy global warming heat. Um, I love it. <laughs> I love too the way you just started going back, back, back into the into the traffic area. <laughs> like, yeah, hey, Scott, yeah. don't go too far. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Some of my staff and volunteers at times were like, Scott. <laughs> Take care of yourself. <laughs> but it, but it illustrates, uh, you know, the the arrogance of of space that that we have turned over to the automobile, and as you just demonstrated, for no good reason because it's not actually utilized for that purpose. And 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 you're absolutely right. I mean, what a great uh, what a great idea, what a great opportunity to try to transform that space that is currently. You know, I won't even say four cars. It's just been treated as if it is and been paved over, you know, paradise being paved over. I mean, let's depave it. Let's, you know, be able to put something in there and, and bring things to life. And, and 
to your point, deal with some of that heat island effect. Yeah, it's this is very near and dear to my heart. You know, I mean, I think the idea of unlocking public space, I mean, I really see public space as kind of like the bedrock of our democracy. And we've given it over so much of, of it over to um, to cars. And it's been a huge problem. I'm really inspired by what's happening all around the world. You look to places like Paris that are redesigning their iconic squares and, and, and circles and giving them back to the, to the people. You look to Barcelona um, with their super block plan, uh, which I think is the most ambitious thing I've seen anywhere in the world around public space. And uh, we need to start moving in that direction. People are hungry um to be in space with others so i want to bring a bit of that into los angeles where we're not quite at that level yet but we can be it with some better leadership so scott um here you're i think you're talking about the potential for a reimagined santa monica boulevard um why don't you set this up and what's the why is santa monica boulevard so important to the city yeah, so Santa Monica Boulevard is, you know, one of the most iconic boulevards in Los Angeles. Um, it goes all the way from around Silver Lake, uh, uh, where it joins with Sunset Boulevard and goes downtown, all the way to the beach. So it's a really important east-west uh, thoroughfare through um, uh, through Los Angeles. Um, the the section that I talk about here is incredibly wide <laughs> i mean it's really a des designed as a highway and so it, there's kind of uh an amazing opportunity to think about what this could be like in the future fantastic let's hit play and as sam says very well the width of this corridor is is sort of an unprecedented opportunity in los angeles there are we have a lot of wide streets but not a lot of streets this one and so what could that look like um, I think Santa Monica Boulevard could be LA's version of the High Line in New York City or Las Ramblas in, in, in Barcelona, a world-class linear park. It could be a complete street with a cycle track and bus rapid transit with its own dedicated right-of-way. The size of the street actually allows for more. We could have a linear park here. So one of the things that we need to talk about is this boulevard is flanked by a lot of multifamily housing, um, which has little to no in the way of services. There's no park within walking distance. There's no library. There are a couple business-oriented cafes, no market. You have to go to Westwood Boulevard th for that or Westwood Village. Nothing within walking distance at all. Um, so we could redesign Santa Monica Boulevard really to be the vibrant heart of this community. We also have some really exciting like physical elements that could make it really, really vibrant. We have this topography here. What if it was, you know, viewpoints, a cafe looking over to this view, maybe a, a rock climbing wall on the bottom. You could engage people in a kind of participatory process to try to figure out, you know, what is, what is the park element that you want on your block? You know, is it a playground? Is it an outdoor exercise area? There's a lot that could happen here um, if we have the political will to do so. Well, and I guess that's kind of the whole point <laughs> in terms of the political will. So uh, talk a little bit about the the, the race. At, uh, you know, again, I don't follow the politics in, in Los Angeles mm -hmm. at all. So, um, but yeah. I mean, is this unusual for an urbanist to be running for city council in Los Angeles? It is. Yeah, it, it truly is. Um, you know, I think we've had uh, we've had a few candidates that would probably self-identify as urbanists who uh, did okay um, in the last few years, and and we do have a broader progressive movement in the city, which I consider myself a part of. Um, and I think things are changing in Los Angeles. So the, the big game changer is that uh, we have moved from an odd year election cycle to an even year election cycle. So that puts us, our elections um, uh, happen, happening concurrently with state and federal elections, which uh, of course okay. greatly in, increases turnout. 
So we and, saw and the city council every two years or four years. Yeah, so it's every four years, but it's staggered. Okay. So seven seven seats, one 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 two years, and then in the, the other eight seats two years later. Um, so there'll be like there's eight seats up this this uh, 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 this year. Um, and so in the last cycle, we saw kind of like the first data points for that new even year electorate, and it turned out to be as transformational as some of us were imagining it would be. Right. So Nithya Raman, um, very progressive council member, w was the first to defeat an incumbent in 18 years in Los Angeles, oh, wow. running on an extremely progressive uh, uh, platform on housing. Homelessness was her main issue, but also a strong supporter of, of uh, multimodal transportation. Uh, Lorraine Lung Lundquist almost uh, beat um, the chief of staff uh, of the prior council member uh, in one of the most conservative districts in the city, in the kind of deep valley. Mm -hmm. um, so she didn't quite get there. But we saw that, that this more progressive, broader electorate is very much going to be a factor moving forward. So um, that's really exciting to me. Um, and the other thing that's happened is like a lot, of, a lot more young people are just engaged in local politics now with Black Lives Matter and with uh, the pandemic. You know, there's been a real awakening that a lot of those policy levers are local and you, you need to pay attention and get engaged. So our campaign is about doing just that, about getting new voters uh, involved. UCLA is part of the fifth district. Um, home of tens of thousands of, of, of young people um, who uh, we're looking to get engaged in this campaign. That's going to be a strong focus um, to activate the campus community. Um, it's also my particular race is a, is a crowded race. Um, there are six candidates. Um, uh, some of them have a lot more connection to money and power than I do. Um, but we have a lot of grassroots energy. Um, and so uh, we're trying to engage um, the voters that are passionate about the same issues that we are. And we're feeling very bullish about getting into the into the runoff. Uh, so that's that's kind of a little bit of a, of a lay of the land. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting, too, because, you know, you mentioned that, you know, UCLA is, is part of the district and, and yeah. uh, UCLA, of course, is uh, where Donald Shoup um, is professor and, you know, obviously wrote the, the book High Cost of Free Parking. And you had yeah. mentioned, you know, parking a couple of times uh, earlier. Uh, it's also uh, where uh, Dr. Rick, um, Richard Jackson, Dick Jackson, um, you know, was is now professor emeritus. Uh, there is school of public health. Um, Mm -hmm. I've had the opportunity to address his graduate class a couple of times there at UCLA, and he'll he'll actually be uh, on the podcast here. Um, but one of the things that uh, that Dick has been talking about a lot recently is just the need, the necessity for us to have a sense of urgency about climate change. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that, you know, climate emergency side of it. You you sort of yeah. alluded to it a couple of times, but go a little deeper on that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know. For so many people, I, I, I feel this very keenly. I, I have a four-year-old daughter. I want to build a future for her and her generation and the generations beyond. Um, and a lot of those levers in terms of climate are are local. Um, so and uh, many of the things that we've been talking about in the context of public safety and affordability are also climate levers. So transportation is the highest emitting sector in uh, the California economy. Um, so how do, we, how do we address that? We need to uh, transfer trips from um, motor vehicles to other modes of transportation. Uh, that looks like uh, uh, improving active transportation, imp improving transit service. It looks like ending parking minimums. So we stop kind of uh, incentivizing driving at the expense of other transportation modes. Um, it looks like building a lot of, of, of new housing. 
uh, in CD5, which is rich in jobs and services. So UC Berkeley's study on local climate action actually finds that in nearly every zip code in Council District 5 in Los Angeles, the most powerful thing you can do um, locally in terms of lowering carbon emissions would be to build more housing, infill housing. Um, it's so, it, so we can do a lot of, we can, we can check off a lot of boxes at the same time. Um, and we have a deep uh, and very troubling housing crisis in Los Angeles as well. So infill housing um, obviously helps with that as well. Um, so there's a, there's a whole host of things we can, we, we, we should do. Um, Los Angeles to its credit, um, is moving towards clean energy. Um, so, uh, the city council recently adopted resolution to move to hundred percent renewable energy by 2035. That's great. Now we actually have to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Right. And and we're, we're still doing things that are in the in our region that are contrary to right. that goal. You know, yeah. we're still widening freeways in Los Angeles, which is a sort of a form of insanity. Right. Um, because it's, you know, obviously creates more carbon emissions, but it also wastes finite resources that we could be uh, using to weatherize homes to produce more clean energy, to build the transmission lines, to get that clean energy to our homes. So it's time that, you know, I, I admire the ambition of Los Angeles, but we have to actually implement it now. And that means making hard choices and divesting ourselves from, from uh, strategies that have been damaging uh, and moving towards a cleaner future. Yeah, yeah. And you had mentioned it earlier to, you know, addressing some of that heat island effect with some yeah. uh, aspects of greening and being able yeah. to, you know, create more permeability in, in the infrastructure so that, you know, when you do get a rain event, because they do happen <laughs> on occasion, uh, you're, you're not just seeing, you know, that uh, storm water just simply run off. You need to get some percolation into, uh, you know, into the soil there and, and, and really be able to create uh, you know, more street trees and more opportunities for shade, uh, because the, you know, the fact of the matter is those hot days and that heat emergency side of things is going to, you know, be affecting lives, especially when you're looking at, uh, you know, folks that, you know, are, you know, lower down on the income scale. So that really mm -hmm. hits them, uh, proportionately more. Um, Scott, we're coming up to the end of our time. Is there anything that we haven't yet talked about that you want to make sure that, uh, we leave the audience with? Oh gosh, what a great question. Um, here's, here's what I would say. Um, uh, don't be intimidated to build your community. You know, I, I think that uh, the voices of no um, in cities around the world want to mystify the process of making your city greener, more climate resilient, uh, more lively, more vibrant, more beautiful, more community oriented. And I would say it's not that mystical. <laughs> it's pretty simple and you can teach yourself the tools. That's what I did. You know, when I was building, uh, conceiving that neighborhood greenway project that we started off the show with, I'm kind of a self-taught urban planner. I'm a policy analyst by trade. I was really passionate about urban design, but I didn't know much about it, you know? And I looked at NACTO guides and I spent a lot of time on Google Maps and, and I read the city's mobility plan and I created something that was in line with that community, that, that mobility plan that wasn't particularly being implemented and I advocated for it. So if you're passionate about something, I would say, get involved. The local level is the level at which you can have a huge impact very quickly if you just show up. Because if you don't show up, other folks will. Um, so that, that would be my call to action for your listeners, your viewers. Get involved. You're going to change the world right in your own community. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. And and I love how you also channeled the fact that there's 
that immediate local benefit of, you know, that vibrancy and that sustainability that happens, you know, at that local level. And, and to channel Donald Troop again, you know, it, it reminds me of the, the great story just up the road from you there in Pasadena when they've made some policy decisions and they changed their, you know, their approach to parking and, and, and basically, you know, completely revitalized, you know, Colorado Boulevard right there in downtown Pasadena. And I can remember working in, in Pasadena. I, that was one of my first jobs in Southern California after graduate school was, you know, right there on Colorado. And, you know, back in the early 90s, it, nobody went there. I mean, it was hard for me just to f even find a decent restaurant there. But now <laughs> it's this vibrant place. And it was because of the, the changing of the policies, reinvesting the money that they were able to generate locally, you know, from, you know, the paid parking structure that, uh, that they, you know, used in terms of the model. So yeah, it, it, it's so important to, to realize that, you know, you individually as, as community members, you know, can be powerful, but then also that overlay of how important it is to, to have some strategic thinking in terms of a policy perspective. So good stuff. Such a pleasure chatting with you, John. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you very much, and and best of luck with the you know continued luck with the campaign. Yeah, and and you can check us out and learn all about the campaign at scottforla.com. Fantastic. Thank you so much for watching this episode of the Active Towns Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please give it a like, leave a comment, and maybe even share it with a friend, especially if they happen to be in Scott's district there in, in Los Angeles. They'd appreciate that, I'm sure. Two final things. Just want to remind everybody about the Active Town store. Head on over, check out some of my fun Streets Are For People swag that I have out there. And finally, I hope you're able to get outside for some fresh air, maybe go for a bike ride or a hike. Well, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. <laughs>